service because we get to partake in communion. So let's begin with a little song to kind of get us kind of get us ready. Knowing I'm 
announcements, some very exciting announcements, and Nikwan and Eric are going to help us get ready for those announcements. I was watching TV this week and I got inspired by something. Thank you very much. Let's give the guys a hand. Well, we have not one, but four individuals sitting here to help us with a little reminder. This is a story about four people. Everybody, somebody, anybody, and nobody. There was an important job to be done, and everybody was asked to do it. Everybody was sure that somebody would do it. Anybody could have done it, but nobody did. Somebody got angry because it was everybody's job. Everybody knew that anybody could do it, but nobody realized that somebody wouldn't do it. Somebody should have done the job, and everybody should have, but in the end, nobody did, and anybody could. The end. <laughs> 
Now, why the story about these four? Well, because this month we have some very exciting outreach ministries and activities that we need everybody, not just somebody, but everybody to participate in. First of all, a big thanks to the 11, yes, 11 volunteers who attended our Ginter Hall outreach. And I was so excited and moved when we were, when I was walking around during the bingo game, Mr. Pete is up there with the There we go. Mr. Pete is up there with the Mr. Pete just started coming to Ginter Hall last month. I mean, sorry, in July. And the just started coming to Ginter Hall in July. Mr. Pete had such a hard time figuring out the bingo card and reading the numbers, and he was he was doing he was doing a bad job. So we put the quant together with Mr. Pete, and Mr. Pete started winning. And this past this past Tuesday, I was walking by when I heard Mr. Pete turn to the quant and said, "It's a good thing you're here." Yeah. I just, I, I just started crying because you know what? If the quant would have been there, he would have said, "Oh, somebody else can show up." Mr. Pete would have had help. We, we were stretched thin this past season. But thanks to Daquan, Mr. Pete got some prizes. So thank you, Daquan. Thank you. So please, 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 we have another Get Your Hall outreach coming up, and we could really use your help. There are lots of folks who don't ever go to bingo, only when we show up, because we have helpers. So thank you, thank you. So please show up for the next one in September. Then, I want to remind you that our Hallelujah is coming up next Sunday. So we will not be here next Sunday. We will be at the Pony Pasture Park at 6 p.m. It's a Hawaiian-themed picnic and baptism. And here are some pictures from our last Hallelujah. And you get an idea of what it's like. And it's a lot of fun. And it's also a wonderful time to share the love of God with those around us. My group Thursday. Yes, and this Thursday, if you're going to be baptized, we have a special meeting here. Oh, we baptized. Yes, so we're asking everyone to show up for a special meeting at 5.30 Thursday in the gallery. And also next Sunday, you're going to have three opportunities for give, to give. Everybody, anybody, somebody, everybody will have an opportunity to give. We're going to be collecting for our, for our food bank for the closed pantry and also our offering. So please make sure that you come prepared to give next week. Then also want to remind you that our Bible study starts here at the gallery in the Gay Community Center of Richmond starting September 14th. Now this Friday, at the following Friday, we're very excited because it's the first time we're going to have a Bible study here at the gallery. And it's, it's going to be so much easier to be able to tell people at Friday, oh yeah, it's at the Community Center every second and fourth Friday. So please be praying for that so that the Lord may bring more people into our ministry. And Pride is coming up. We need everybody's help, people of all backgrounds, to help staff the booth. You can be here for one hour. All we're asking is for one hour so that when people find, pass by, they see someone who looks just like them. I don't look like Alexa. Lily doesn't look like Pastor Gray. We all are different colors, different shades. So people are less threatened if they see someone just like them. Okay, we have straight people, gay people, all kinds of people showing up, walking at the Pride. So we would love to have you there. And you can sign up in the fellowship hall after church today. And I want to remember, for more information and inspiration, visit our website. Our main website is newbeginnerschristianchurch.org. And also, if you can't be here, you can always see us on Ustream.tv channel NBCCRVA. And now for our call to worship. Let's all get our hearts and minds prepared to worship and let us proclaim the good news to everybody everywhere in our community. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. Pastor Phil. Well, I want to welcome. Have a seat here. Everybody <laughs> to the service and somebody. somebody to the service and anybody to the service. I'm glad that I'm not welcoming nobody to the service. So, um, we do we do have some folks who are unable to be with us uh, this week. Um,
We have some folks because of the inclement weather, so pray for them. Uh, and also, especially, please pray for our folks who are under the weather, who are uh, ill at home, and for those who are in the hospital. Uh, we have Abigail, who is out um, today, and also Stacy, who have both asked for uh, our prayers. Uh, one is in the hospital and one is sick at home. So please keep uh, those two individuals especially in your prayers, along with all of those who continue to be in our prayers for healing um, on a weekly basis. So you know what? The Bible says that uh, the Lord is always faithful to answer the prayers of his children. And sometimes we have to uh, just uh, be persistent and keep going to the Lord and ask him for the same thing. Because, you know, there's, uh, there's biblical uh, reasons for doing that as well. Amen? Amen. So uh, never grow tired of going to the Lord in prayer. Keep those petitions before the Lord day after day. So join with me tonight. Let's stand before the Lord and uh, let's begin our uh, service of worship uh, in prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for the opportunity to be here in your presence tonight. We honor you by standing in your presence because, Lord God, you said that we could come boldly to the throne. You give us that opportunity, Lord, and you welcome us with open arms. Lord, we never have to sneak in through a back door to be with you. We never have to come ashamed, Lord, as we stand before you. You said that we are to come boldly to your throne. And so today, Lord, we come boldly before you. And we ask, Lord, that uh, your acceptance uh, be just so palpable in this place, Lord, that we can leave this place ultimately not only feeling good about ourselves, Lord, but feeling good about our relationship with you. Because, Lord, you want nothing more to have a right relationship with us. Lord, I pray that you would just mend our hearts, Lord, and our minds, and help us, Lord, to do the things that you would have us do, to be the person that you would have us be, and to always make ourselves open and available to your will and to your spirit. Lord, move in us tonight. Teach us something new about you and help us, Lord, to worship you in spirit and in truth because you, above all, are welcome in this place tonight. It is you that we came to spend time with. It is you who we came to sing our praises to. It is you that we came to lift our voices in prayer and in praise to. It is you, Lord, that uh, take the place of honor in this worship service tonight, Lord. Truly, your majesty is worth our worship. And so tonight, Lord, we bow before you, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Lord, be God in us. Be Lord over us tonight. In Jesus' name we ask it. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. Turn around and greet somebody this evening, if you would.
Christian Church will be serving our community through Jesus Christ with love, hope, and ministry. Amen. Amen. Now it's Spanish. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and we're very excited because next week at the baptism, we're actually going to a park that is the number one park that Hispanics go to to have picnics. So we're very excited. So, New Beginnings Christian Church, Restaurando Amor, Esperanza y Ministerio. A nuestra comunidad por medio de Jesucristo. Amén. Amén. Are you ready to read? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. For God so loved me that he gave his only begotten son. So that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Surely he has borne our grief and carried our sorrows and pain. Surely he has borne my grief and carried my sorrows and pain. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. He was pierced for my transgressions. He was crushed for my iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. The punishment that brought me peace was upon him. And by his wounds, I am healed. Amen. So tonight we are celebrating. We are celebrating that Jesus took our place. That Jesus loved us so much. Amen. So next week when we're at the park, we're going to be singing this song. We sing it in English, but we're going to sing it in Spanish tonight and next week. So, James, if you'll show us the words, good. Everybody say, Soy feliz. Soy feliz. Cristo me salvó. Cristo me salvó. Soy feliz. Soy feliz. Cristo me salvó. Cristo me salvó. And then the next part is Canto Gloria, Aleluya. Say that with me. Canto Gloria, Aleluya. Cristo me salvó. Cristo me salvó. Amen. Please rise and let's try. I'm so glad Jesus set me free, but in Spanish. <laughs> Here we go, Soy feliz, Soy feliz, Cristo me salvó, 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 Soy feliz, Cristo me Thank you. 
Continue to show us, even when we turn our back on you, even when we fail to love you, you still love us regardless. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your love, for taking our sins upon the cross, for seeing love throughout all generations, keeping your love here with us. Tonight, as we prepare to receive the elements from the Lord's table, I want to read to you the passage from the Old Testament. Normally, we always think about the New Testament when we talk about the Lord's Supper because it was in the New Testament that we read where Jesus broke bread at the time of Passover with his disciples, and he passed the cup around, and he said, this is the cup of my, my blood, representing the new covenant that I made with broke the bread. He said, this is my body that is broken for you. The disciples sitting there at that time really did not understand exactly what he meant because he was saying it in the context of a festival, of a holiday that they had celebrated year after year all their lives. It would be like somebody walking into the middle of our Thanksgiving or our, in the middle of our Christmas celebration and doing something new and adding a new meaning to something that we've done over and over every single year. We wouldn't understand it immediately. But then as soon as they saw the fulfillment of it just a few days later as Jesus hung on the cross, those words had to come back and, and echo in their ears. But the Old Testament is a foreshadowing of things that happen in the New. And there are many times in the Old Testament where we can read about things yet to come things that have been fulfilled in the New Testament, which just adds validation to the Word of God, because the Word of God is the same yesterday, the same today, and the same forever. Amen? Amen. The Word of God is unchanging. The promises that God made thousands of years ago are still valid and still good until God says no more. And God hadn't said that yet. God says that my answers are always what? Yes and amen. amen. Praise the Lord for that. In the book of Psalm, we read this. Psalm 116, verse 8 says, For you, O Lord, have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believe, therefore, and I said, I am greatly afflicted. And in my dismay, I said, all men are liars. How can I repay the Lord for all his goodness to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of his people. Tonight we have an opportunity to fulfill our vows to the Lord in the presence of his people. Tonight we have the opportunity to lift up the cup of salvation and give thanks to the Lord and say in our own words, how can I say thanks to the Lord for all his great mercy and wonder and goodness to me? Let that be your prayer and your thought as we pass the elements of communion among us. Really, if you would come up here. Thank you, Lord. 
as the elements are being passed, you may sit in silence to meditate, or you may join us in singing your recognize. <laughs> disciples, this was something which you knew was inevitable, Lord, but you went to this willingly, because it is through your body that we can be the body of Christ. It is the body that you inhabited on earth that gives us the example which we can follow in our individual lives and in our corporate lives as a church, Lord. As we move forward, let us always look to you for our example. As we partake of this bread, Lord, let us once again remember not only the suffering which you endured on our behalf, but the salvation that you brought through it. Lord, tonight, just as in the words of the psalmist, we lift up the cup of our salvation before you, and we ask, Lord, that you would remind us once again of the relationship that we have with you because of the work of Jesus. Because Jesus shed his blood, Lord, we have that, that means of communication with you directly, Lord, no longer through the blood of sacrificed animals, no longer through the work of the priests, Lord, but we can come directly to your throne of grace. We can speak to you as children speak to their fathers. We can speak to you, Lord, directly and without any reservation, knowing, Lord, that you hold no bar against us. You don't hinder us in any way from approaching you. 
because the love that you have for us overflows. And like the story of the prodigal son, all we have to do is turn and begin our journey back to you, and you come running to us with arms wide open. That's the amount of love that you have for us. So tonight, Lord, as we partake of this small cup of juice, we ask, Lord, that you would remind us of all that you have been through on our behalf so that we don't have to do it. All we have to do is be partakers once again. Even on, as on the day that we received you as our Savior, all we had to do was ask, and we received within ourselves the fullness of your salvation. So tonight, Lord, all we have to do is sip this tiny little cup to remind us that we are in taking, partaking, and imbuing ourselves, Lord, with the fullness of God Almighty in our lives. Please rise and let's sing so our shares the go right now. So our shares we offer the So this evening, um, I wanted to continue the, the discussion of communion that we just had. Partly because it's fresh in our minds, but also because we're going to be partaking of communion again next week at our outdoor baptismal service. I think it's highly meaningful for uh, baptismal candidates to come up out of the water and to be able to uh, partake of the Lord's table. Uh, once again, uh, fresh and anew. And yes, the James River will be refreshing and <laughs> renewing. Amen? Amen. Flood waters don't scare us. It just means that more stuff's passing, you know, and, and, and that's representation of our lives, right? You know, sometimes we need a little extra stuff to be passed out of our lives, you know. Get rid of some things, pare down, you know. Praise the Lord. So, a reminder to us. So tonight, uh, as we uh, were drinking the, the cup, which represents the blood of Jesus, I, I was reminded, as I always am, every first Sunday of the month, that there are a multitude of churches out there now that refuse to acknowledge the blood of Jesus. Uh, some decided it's too gory, it's, it's too, um, you know, too offensive uh, to some of the the children of God, but I, I, I would rather us be mature in our faith than to have to uh, reduce and sort of uh, distill the Word of God down so that it's palatable for even the, the weakest among us. I have for a long time thought that it's rather ridiculous for churches to want to um, cater to the the, the ones in, in our midst that have the biggest problem with the things of Scripture, instead of helping them along so that they can get better and get well. I've said for a long time, I think it's like this. If somebody came to our church and had a broken ankle, the way that a lot of churches would have us be is to say, oh, well, this person has a broken ankle by no you know, doing of their own. So in order to not discriminate, we should all break our ankles and all come to church with broken ankles. That's ridiculous. Who's going to volunteer for that? Not me. 
But instead, isn't it much smarter to say, we will help you with your broken ankle and help get you well and get you beyond that broken ankle so that we can all come in in wholeness, in understanding, and in, in our personage, you know, so that we can worship together and that we can be all on the same page. So when people say, oh, that part of the scripture scares me, I don't like seeing pictures of a crucified Jesus, I could never watch that movie, The Passion of Christ, because that's just way too much for me. I say, well, that's, you know, you, there's, no, there's no mandate that you have to watch that movie, you know, but you have to do something with the crucified Jesus in your life. If we consistently want to think about Jesus as that good shepherd with the little lamb around his shoulders, or we consistently want to see Jesus in our mind as that benevolent person with a little lamp knocking on a door waiting to be let in, then you have missed out on the whole person of Jesus. If you want to be in a relationship with me, personally, me, I would rather that you get to know me, right? Not just as the person who stands up here once a week and talks uh, to you about the scriptures. I would rather that you get to know me not just as a person who works at a high school during the week. I would rather that you get to know me, you know, not just as the person who does a particular thing, so that that's the only image you have of me. I could say the same of you. It would be very difficult to, uh, to give uh, a description of you if I, if I had to, based only on what I see of you once a week. Does that make sense? If you go missing and they say, oh, Pastor Greg, we understand that this person comes to your church. Okay, what, what does this person do? Um, well, they come to church once a week. You know? <laughs> what do they look like? Well, when they come to church, they look like this, you know. I don't know. You might wear a uniform uh, during the week when you go to work. I don't know. You might, uh, I don't know, you might drive a, some kind of truck or a bus or something like that. But if I don't know that about you, how am I going to relate to you in that way? Do you understand what I'm saying? It's the same thing with Jesus. We need to understand the, fulfill, the fulfillment of Jesus. We need to understand not only baby Jesus in a manger, we need to understand Jesus on the cross. So that we can understand the resurrected Jesus out of the tomb. We love to, to celebrate resurrected Jesus, the Jesus who can come into our hearts and change our lives. But what good does it do to want to look at a resurrected Jesus if we're not willing to look at what Jesus was resurrected from? We always want to think about that glorious by and by, but we don't want to think about the here and now or how we're going to get there. You know, people say, I'm not afraid of dying, of being dead. I'm afraid of dying. You know, it's that process that we don't want to think about as humans. But it's that very process that Jesus went through on your behalf so that you don't have to be crucified, so that you don't have to try to shed your blood to save your soul. So tonight, I want us to look straight into the whole subject of the blood of Jesus. It is the blood of Jesus that cleanses us and makes us free and makes us whole. We sing lots of songs about it. But I want it to be more than just a song that we sing. I want us to understand what it is that we're truly all about. Amen? Amen. I'm going to preach to you tonight on the book of Leviticus. Don't get nervous. It's going to be okay. You know? There's some good to be found in everything, right? Yeah. Okay, here we go. This is what the book of Leviticus says in the 17th chapter, 11th verse. Says, For the life of a creature is in the blood. Does that make sense? And I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. Now, of course, in the Old Testament days, what are they talking about? The blood of Jesus or the blood of sacrificial animals? The blood of sacrificial animals. But here he says very distinctly that the, that the life of a creature is in what? The blood. You, if, if you drained all your blood out of you, it wouldn't do you any good if your brain was still working, your heart, well, none of it would work because you would have no blood pumping through you. It's the blood running through you that gives you life, right? So here we understand because we are told uh, by the directions that God is giving to the priests of that day 
that blood is what not only gives us life, but it also makes atonement for one's life. Because it is the life-giving force, it is then, therefore, the thing that atones for one's life. Okay, are you all with me? So That wasn't so bad, right? Okay. Look with me also now in the New Testament. Jesus said, for this is my blood of the New Covenant, of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. That's what he's talking about when he lifted the cup before his disciples and he said, this represents my blood. That's what his blood is for. Paul also says in the book of Colossians, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood is no remission. And then he also said, we have redemption through the blood, even the forgiveness of sins. So in the first part, he's referring to the old system of making sacrifices of doves and calves and oxen and sheep and rams and goats and all those kinds of things. And then in the second part, he's saying, we now have redemption through the blood. Whose blood now? Lambs and goats? No the blood of Jesus. Amen. Also, in 1 Peter, Peter says this, We are not redeemed with silver and gold and precious stones, but with the precious blood of Christ. And also in 1 John, we read where John talks about the, the other what the other writers had said, Peter and Paul, and he says, The blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. I think that is... Uh, an amazing statement, but we're so used to hearing it that we kind of gloss over it. But in the old system of blood sacrifices, you had to get a particular animal to be rid of particular kinds of sins. For different types of atonement, you needed to get different kinds of sacrifice. And through the blood of doves, you could be atoned for one thing, and it took a calf to do something else, and it took a sheep to, you know, do this or that. It took a particular kind of sheep to do a, a certain kind of thing, whereas one that had maybe a spot or a wrinkle here or there would be okay to atone for certain lesser sins. But here we are told very clearly that through the blood of Jesus, we are forgiven of what? All sins. Wow. I am so glad of that. And as an animal lover, I am so glad that I don't have to weekly take in your, the animals that you bring into church and slaughter them up here in front of everybody. And, you know, some of you might have to bring some doves, and some of you might have to bring a whole oxen in because you was really bad last week. You know, here we go, and what a mess. I'm so glad that I don't have to be a butcher, you know. Amen. I am so glad that the blood of Jesus covers all of those things. Amen. And we have that accessibility to the blood of Jesus at all times, right? All right, so tonight I want to look at a couple of different things about the blood of Jesus. The first thing I want us to look at is that the blood of Jesus is perfect. That is why it is important that we understand the birth and life and conception and everything about Jesus. You see, because I was born from the seed of a man and a woman, my blood is not perfect. I very possibly inherited some things that might turn up to be a disease in my life from one of my parents. I may have inherited some uh, particular traits from one or, or both of my parents. I know that my father passed away from esophageal cancer. That could be something that gets handed down to me. I don't know because that's my bloodline, right? Not only that, but I inherited some emotional, mental, you know, behavioral, characteristic kind of traits from my parents. That's not unreasonable to, to think either. But Jesus, you see, Jesus' father had no diseases to pass down. Jesus' father had no bad uh, traits to pass on. Why? Because Jesus' Father was God Almighty. And that's why it's important for us to understand that. The scripture tells us how perfect the blood of Jesus is. Look at uh, these uh, couple of verses here. G Paul explains it this way. He says, For God has made Jesus to be sin for us, who knew no sin, 
that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Wow. He says that's the whole reason that God had Jesus come down here in human form in the first place. God made him for that, to be sin for us, to be that sacrificial lamb, to take away all of our sins. And then in 2 Peter we read this, Who did not sin, neither, talking about Jesus, neither was guile found in his mouth. Wow, how about that? Not only did it say Jesus didn't sin, but he didn't even talk trash about people. I don't know a single person, alive or dead, who could ever be said, uh, that would be said of, except for Jesus, who had no sin and had, had no guile, not, not a single bad thing to say. And then in 1 John, it says it very simply, very plainly, in him is no sin. The blood of Jesus is perfect. More perfect than any sacrificial animal that we could ever find, you know. So an animal may be outwardly perfect, have no spot. It might be a perfectly beautiful white little lamb with no, no freckle on it at all. But who knows what's going on on the inside. That lamb might be, might be not long for this world because maybe it's got some kind of lamb cancer. Who knows, you know? We would have to nowadays take it not only to the priest, but to the veterinarian to get a, a real clean bill of health in order to sacrifice an animal that's perfect. But we don't have to because Jesus is perfect and the blood of Jesus is perfect. Amen? Secondly, the blood of Jesus is pure. What do I mean by that? Well, the blood of Jesus can make recompense for us because of its not only the perfection of it, but the purity of it. So on occasion, I get this question. Why do we serve juice and not wine? Or why don't we offer our folks the combination of juice and wine? And I've kind of always said, well, you know, um, some people, you know, can't be around wine at all, you know, because it's not good for them and it might cause them to stumble. And the Bible says all things are permissible for us to do unless they cause somebody else to stumble, right? So if it's going to create sin, whether in you or in somebody else, don't do it. That should be an, enough, and usually it is enough of an explanation. But here's the real spiritual answer for you. Hopefully I don't have to say this over and over. Let me just tell it to you this one time. Here's the real spiritual reason why I think it's better to serve grape juice than wine. The wine that we just participated in the drinking of was not fermented grape droppings. <laughs> it was grape juice, right? The, it's to represent the perfect and pure blood of Jesus, right? Wine is wine because it is grape juice that has gone through a fermentation process. Fermentation is a, is a form of rotting, right? It's where it sits and it degrades a little bit. At that point, I don't think that that represents the pure and perfect blood of Jesus anymore because the blood of Jesus is not fermented. The blood of Jesus is not rotten. And when the blood of Jesus comes into your life, you do not become fermented, and you don't rot either. You become new. Jesus says, don't put new wine into old wineskins, and don't do the reverse either. Don't put old wine into new wineskins. Why is that? Does anybody know why that's a bad idea, and why they didn't want to do it back then? I'll tell you why. Because the old wine has been good and fermented, right? Have you ever seen the process of fermentation? It produces gases and things like that, you know, and it's almost like you would take a bottle of soda and shake it a little bit and, you know, it starts to swell up the, the plastic bottle. And you know what happens if you go ahead and, and untwist that lid? What's going to happen? It's going to spew all over you. So the same idea, if you put old wine into a new wine skin that just freshly been made, it hasn't had time to stretch and everything, it's going to bust the skin because it's going to cause it to swell and pow, you, you, you're gonna be, it's going to break and then you're going to lose the, the wine and the wine skin and everything. So everything in its proper place. So I believe that the, the, what, the juice that we use is a better representation of the pure and perfect blood of Jesus 
than something that's fermented and half rotten. Plus, I don't want to have to drive all y'all home. You know, you know, <laughs> that. So there's the other reason. So. In the book of Hebrews, we learn this. For it is the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies the purifying of the flesh. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purging, purge your consciousness uh, from dead works to serve the living God. Here we have a couple of ideas that we understand that we don't have to sacrifice bulls and what does he mention here, goats and, and heifers and all of that that it's through Christ because Christ is living still in us in the, through the power and the person of the Holy Spirit. So that Christ is now not a dead offering. Christ is a living sacrifice. And that is what we are to offer ourselves to God also, a living sacrifice. So our sacrifices don't have to die anymore. Our sacrifices can live on as we live on, day by day, being a living sacrifice. Even as he said, be, let, your, let your dead works serve a living God. That means that we are to die to our old self and offer ourselves anew to the Lord, who is a living God. Amen? All right. Thirdly, and kind of quickly, I want to look at this idea of the blood of Jesus being perpetual. So we've talked about Jesus being a living sacrifice. But here, you see how they used to have to bring these animals to be uh, looked over. And then once the sacrifice was made, the search had to begin almost immediately for another perfect lamb, for another uh, perfect offering to come uh, before the, the, the temple so the priest could, could give it the once over and decide whether or not you were going to be forgiven for this thing again, the atonement. This is what the book of Hebrews says. Who doesn't need daily, as those high priests, to offer up sacrifices for his own sins and then for the people's sins too? For this Christ did once, not over and over, when he offered up himself. So it's a one-time thing that continues to go on and on and on. When I was a kid, I used to be uh, enamored with the idea of the perpetual motion machine, you know? That, uh, that you, the thing that you could get started and it would just continue to go on and, and regenerate itself over and over. And I don't know if you've seen some of those things that they kind of uh, mimic that idea, but uh, for a long time they had the little things that you could buy people to set on their desks. There was a series of little steel balls in a hung by chains and you would pull the end one and let go and it would click and what happened? It would knock the one on the other end and click, click, click and it would go for quite a while, right? But eventually, it's going to come down to where it's just still again. The blood sacrifice of Jesus was once, but for all. Because it continues to do the work in us. That's why so many times when we have our communion, I say that it is the blood of Jesus flowing through us now that makes us a family, that makes us a body of Christ. And one or two or twelve or a hundred of us may die off. But there's one or two or 12 or hundreds of us that join into the family of God. And so the, the body of Christ is perpetually moving in the earth today through us. How about that? All right. Lastly, I want us to look at the idea of the permanence of the blood of Jesus. I want to uh, share this uh, one quick little story with you. That I love this, where the, the lady, she goes to the photography studio to have her portrait done. And he, the photographer looks at her and click, he snaps her picture and she says, now do me justice. Anybody ever said that? Do me justice. And under his breath, he whispers, honey, you don't need justice, you need mercy. You know? <laughs> That's not good news to get, right? But I tell you, would you rather have justice or would you rather have mercy? Think about it for a minute. Here's a portrait that uh, will be familiar to a lot of us, most of us. This picture of O.J. Simpson. We remember O.J. Simpson was accused of a crime, and he, he went uh, before the, the court system, before the judges, and he was acquitted. And people say, oh, well, 
That way, he didn't get justice, though. A lot of people today think that he did not get justice. Justice was not served. Well, maybe you think that, maybe you don't. But let me ask you this. Should we always have justice? Or should we have mercy? Think about the things in your life, the crimes that you have committed, the sins that you have done. Do you really want justice? Or would you rather have mercy? You bet. Mercy, mercy me. Yes. Of course we want mercy. There's a big difference between the two. Isaiah 44 says this, I have blotted out as a thick cloud your transgressions and as a cloud your sins. Return to me, God says, for I have what? Redeemed you. Past tense, redeemed you. It's already done. So see, God wants to cover up our transgressions. That's our crimes and our sins. God says, I will cover them over when you are redeemed. That is an acquittal right there. God says, I will acquit you of those things, you know, and we'll move into the realm of mercy. Praise God for that. Amen. All right. In closing, I just want to share this little story with you that I think relates to the way through the blood of Jesus, God works within us. There's a story that um, came out right after World War I. There was a father and a son. The mother had passed away. Father and the son, they loved to collect paintings of Monet and uh, Van Gogh. And the father had been collecting these really, these real paintings for a while. And uh, his son, he and his son began to travel. They would even travel the world uh, together uh, in search of a painting or two that might come up for sale that were not already in museums. And, he had amassed this very valuable collection of Monet and uh, Van Gogh paintings. And of course, if you know anything about art, the, the, the paintings gain uh, popularity and, um, and go up in price after the artist has died and years pass. And the older that a painting is, the more valuable it becomes if it's well cared for. And so this father and his son, they had a beautiful home um, here in the United States, and they had displayed all of these paintings, and the father had one particular one which he loved the most, uh, a, a Monet, which he had hanging over the fireplace. World War I came along, and the son went off to war, and he was in France, and he, the story goes that he was helping a couple of soldiers out of a tough spot when he was shot and killed. And so the word got back to the father, and he went into a deep depression because he and his son were extremely close. One day, a knock came to his door, and the father went to the door, and there stood a young man who was disabled, obviously war wounds, and he said, I was one of the young men that your son helped drag out of this foxhole when he was killed. And he had told us how he loved art. And he sat for me one day and allowed me to paint a picture of him. And he said, I would like to give you this picture that I painted of your son. And so the father looked at it, and though it wasn't you know, on the same scale as his Monet's or his Van Gogh's, he took the painting and he looked right into the face of his son, whom he hadn't seen in so long. And he decided what to do with it then and there. So he took it to the fireplace and he moved all the really expensive, wonderful, world-renowned art out of the way and he put his son's picture there in the place of prominence so he could look up at it. And there he sat, heartbroken about his son until the day that he died. So when his will was presented, the lawyers all got together and as I had said, the son was dead, the wife had passed away earlier, and so now all of the wealth, the home, the paintings and everything went up for auction. And so the people all gathered to uh, bid on all these fabulous works of art that they knew that this man had been collecting for years. And as they got seated and prepared, the auctioneer said, okay, now we're going to begin. And they began to bring out the paintings, and they brought the picture of the son in first, and he said, First, we will begin our auction 
with this painting done by an unknown artist of the owner's son. And people in the audience groaned and somebody cried, come on, bring on the Monets. So the auctioneer said, be patient. Do I have any bids for this painting? Will anybody give me $50? $40? For this painting of this young man. $30, $30 to start the bidding. Finally, from the back of the room, a voice said, will you take $10 for it? And the auctioneer said, we'll begin the bidding at $10, $10, I have $10, anybody else? $10, anybody give 15? They said, come on, we want to bid on the Van Goghs. The auctioneer said, very well, sold for $10. The old man from the back came up, collected his painting, gave the auctioneer his $10, and the auctioneer then said, the auction is now closed. People said, what? They were astounded. He said, because in the provisions of the will, the purchaser of the painting of my beloved son receives everything else that goes along with it. So the old man then packed up all of the Monet's, all of the Van Gogh's for $10 and went home. That's Jesus. That's God. God says, with my son, you get the whole kingdom. Everything. How much does it cost to gain the kingdom? It costs the blood of Jesus. That's it. That's all you have to accept, right? Think about Jesus, what Jesus has done in your life, and be thankful for the blood that flows through you at his mercy. The things that gave you acquittal in your life so that you not only receive the blood of the Son of God, but the entire kingdom that goes along with it as well. Amen? Stand up with me tonight, and let's go before the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for your son Jesus, for the blood that he shed for us. Lord God, we thank you that we do not have to make sacrifices anymore. Over and over again, but the blood of Jesus is enough. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious, precious is the blood. That's what makes me white as snow. Thank you, Lord, for the blood of Jesus. Lord, let the blood never, ever lose its power in my life or in the lives of these people in this room tonight. Work it within us, Lord. Help us get it into our minds and into our hearts that you love us so much that you have given us a Holy Ghost transfusion of the blood of Jesus, that it flows through us in power, in perfection, in purity, and in perpetuity, Lord. We don't ever have to get a, a, a re-injection, Lord. We don't ever have to go back and and have a, a redo, but it's good enough once and for all to take care of those things in our lives which are beyond us. The power of the blood of Jesus can set you free. The power of the blood of Jesus can make you whole. The power of the blood of Jesus can bring you out of the pit and deliver into your hands and into your life the kingdom of God Almighty. Amen. As we sing tonight, I would ask that if you have any desire to pray for any decision that you are making, you come. If you want to stand in the gap and pray for somebody possibly who's not here, maybe one of the folks who is out sick tonight, whatever it is, you come and we'll pray together as we sing. What are we going to sing over here? 508, love that they need. 508. I was a, 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 a,
Oh, 
pray. Loving God, we ask that you take this offering that we are about to give, that you multiply it, that you bless each person here and bless those who will receive these offerings. God, help us to multiply so that we may continue to do your work in our community and in the world. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Thank <laughs> you. 
Put them, put them where they were on the tapes. Put them back. <laughs> 